We'll now hear about GI involvement in AL amyloidosis uh, with Dr. John Clark of Stanford. Uh, so Dr. Clark, uh, take it away. Oh, thank you, thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Um, so I am going to talk about um, the, the um, role of amyloid and the gut. And during the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about patterns of um, gastrointestinal involvement uh, symptoms which are um, are um, linked linked with amyloid, uh, diagnostic tests that we have uh, right now, um, um, as well as treatment options, and then I'll talk a little bit about the yield of biopsies from the gastrointestinal standpoint. And if we um, think about the gut, the gut is actually a, a tube that goes from the mouth towards anus, and it's longer than uh, people often think it is. The um, first part is the mouth, then the esophagus. The esophagus is, is about roughly a foot and a half. And then that brings food down towards, um, towards at that point, the stomach, which is about perhaps a, a um, um, foot roughly in length. We then have about 22 feet of small bowel that will um, break down a lot of the food that's there and then absorb it. And then we have about nine feet of large bowel or else colon that takes out a lot of the water that's, that's there and then will change what several liters of fluid that enters the colon to a very small amount of stool that comes out at the end. And inside the gut, there's also different layers. And so the very inner layer is referred to as mucosa. And this is where a lot of the actual breakdown of food takes place and then the absorption. Deeper to that layer, we have um, two separate layers of muscle. And the muscles help to propel the food down, to mix food in the stomach, and to, to, to help things really make, uh, uh, make, make their uh, way through. Um, the gut has a number of nerves which are associated with it. And so there's 500 million nerves which are associated with the gut. Those are both outside the gut and then linked inside in, in both the mucosal layer as well as the muscle layer. And that really regulates the um, coordination of the gut back and forth. And then in all three of those layers, we have blood vessels coming through that help to give oxygen towards the area that's there and then take away nutrients afterwards. And so what we see with amyloid is that the specific symptoms that people get will really be based on how much is there and where exactly the amyloid will um, end up depositing. And so if most of the amyloid is placed within the mucosa, which is that inner layer, then what we see is that there's a decreased absorption in that area. And people tend to get diarrhea uh, as, as uh, well as malabsorption. And so typically with the malabsorption, what happens is that if we don't break down the food which we ingest, then that becomes a source of diarrhea. But um, gut bacteria as well will process that food and then they'll grow to higher amounts and make excess gas. And uh, this is the exact area that we can get a uh, biopsy of. And so if we're doing an upper endoscopy or colonoscopy and taking biopsies, this is really the only layer that we're getting to with those biopsies. If there's deeper involvement within the muscles, then what we tend to see is uh, decreased coordination. And we'll, we'll find that oftentimes food will uh, sit there more, there's gut distension, there might be a um, sense of getting full very quickly, uh, potentially diarrhea, if because of the decreased contractions, there's higher amounts of bacteria, and um, then also constipation. And this is an area where if we're uh, doing an upper endoscopy and colonoscopy and we're taking biopsies, because the muscle layer is deeper than what we typically get with biopsies, we often can't make this diagnosis from the endoscopy and colonoscopy itself. But we can get hints towards this with doing um, um, tests looking at imaging, which will look at the wall thickness of the gut, or doing tests which will look at both the speed with which things move through as uh, well as the contractions. If there's involvement within the nerves, then we tend to see a lot of neuropathy. And oftentimes GI neuropathy will parallel um, nerve symptoms in other areas. And so carpal tunnel, things along those, those lines. Um, but the nerves control a lot of the regulation and the coordination. And so if there's a lot of nerve involvement, 
We'll often see symptoms consistent with um, dysmotility. It's often constipation, diarrhea, as well as often increased sensation within the gut. Um, very similar towards muscle involvement. We can't make this diagnosis necessarily with biopsies during endoscopy and colonoscopy because we're not getting the nerves with those biopsies. But we can infer involvement from other tests looking at the um, strength of the, the strength as well as the um, overall um, uh, contractile, um, contractile cord nation in that area. And then finally, if there's vascular involvement, the blood vessels both bring oxygen towards the gut and then take away nutrients. And so if there's um, any involvement within the, the, um, those vessels, what we tend to see is gastrointestinal bleeding, ischemia, which, which can cause pain and diarrhea. And that's something that we can make the diagnosis of with, um, uh, 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 with, with endoscopy itself. And if we do see something that's actively bleeding, then we can treat that also at the same time. Now, there's a few additional areas that are linked with the gut and are often um, considered to be in the gastrointestinal system that are not in that direct line from mouth, mouth towards anus. And that includes the liver, which ends up processing a lot of toxins and then makes bile that, that dumps into the small bowel, um, but, but it's outside of that direct pathway. And we can see liver involvement. Um, typically what we'll see in that scenario is that we'll see one specific lab is typically higher. And if we do imaging, we'll often see signs of, of uh, potential enlargement. Um, now, um, thankfully, the liver does not have any pain receptors inside it, and so there's often not a lot of symptoms associated with hepatic involvement. There, there is a um, capsule that's that's outside, and so there, there can be a stretching sensation associated with that. And if there's very severe involvement, then it can affect processing of toxins. But that's that's um, that's something which we see more more uh, rare. Thankfully, uh, we can see occasional involvement within the bile ducts and pain pancreas that's also felt to be less common. There are case reports of potential peritonitis as well, which is um, the lining of the gut that's on the outside. And that's felt to, 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 to be uh, less common than the other things that I've talked about. But with the caveat that we don't have a great test to look at, at that per se. Now let's turn from here and talk about symptoms. And symptoms of gastrointestinal involvement are often linked to the uh, both the site of involvement as well as layer of involvement. And so with the esophagus, for instance, um, that really has two functions. The first is to carry food from the mouth down. So if there is involvement with the esophagus, we'll often see problems with um, that function and swallowing issues. Um, and then the second thing that we see with the esophagus is that it's a, a barrier against reflux coming back up. And so if there is esophageal involvement, um, reflux and swallowing issues tend to be the two things that we, we see. Typically, the stomach is involved for storing food, starting to break it down, and then grinding it to um, pieces which are much, much, much smaller. And so if there is stomach involvement, we tend to see abdominal pain, uh, na nausea, occasionally vom vomiting as well, and gut distension. The um, small bowel is the main area that's linked with absorption. And so if that's involved, what we tend to see is diarrhea um, with malabsorption and weight loss. There is this entity referred to as pseudo obstruction where people will act as if they have a bowel obstruction, but when they do imaging, there's just gut distension without any transition point. And this is felt to be secondary to decreased motility, which leads to a higher amount of food retention in the area and then um, ga gas production, which, which can uh, mimic a, um, um, a uh, true obstruction, but is not actually that. Then finally in the colon, what we tend to see is mostly constipation, but some diarrhea. And then if there's sphincter involvement at the very end, fecal incontinence as well. Now, one challenge with this and something that's important to keep in mind is that the symptoms with amyloid are very nonspecific. And so while there are symptoms that can classically be seen with involvement in different areas, these symptoms can also be seen in a number of other conditions, which are more common. And so if you're seeing um, 
uh, some, someone and you have these symptoms, they're probably not going to think of amyloid as the, the, the first line, just because there are things which are more common, which can also do it. And so if we step back and we look at how often we see a lot of these symptoms in um, people within the general population, we, we do see that 20% of American adults will have symptoms of reflux at least once a week. 4% uh, will self-report a prob problem in terms of swallowing. 20 to 30% report what's called functional dyspepsia, which is a sense of discomfort comfort or else bloating after food. 13% uh, of adults will, will have a history of irritable bowel. 15% report constipation, and that's more common past the age of 65. And 6% of adults report, report as well a um, uh, past history of incontinence. And if you go past the age of 65, that's up to about 30. So just because some, someone has amyloid doesn't mean the symptoms are from that. Now, secondly, just because there is a history of amyloid doesn't mean the symptoms are, are, are from that specifically. And so we can see that just because you have amyloid doesn't mean you can't get other conditions such as inflammatory bowel or celiac or else cancer. And it's important to keep those, those in mind as well, and not just assume everything is from amyloid. Then finally, uh, if we look at adverse effects from medications, um, gastrointestinal adverse effects are, are felt to be some of the most common. And they, they have done studies that show that, that if um, someone takes more than five medications, that four or five people will have an adverse effect from that combination or from one of those five. And so a lot of times, um, um, folks in clinic who have GI symptoms and have a known history of amyloid, it's very hard to tease out whether those symptoms are from, from um, elucidate what's, um, what's going on. And so typically endoscopy and colonoscopy are often the first tests which we do. And this allows us to take biopsies. And so if there is any mucosal involvement or potentially vascular involvement, we can get that information from the biopsies. But again, we're not gonna necessarily pick up muscle or nerve involvement with this. We, we also can look to see if there's anything that's bleeding, which we could, could uh, treat potentially, or if there's any narrowing or strictures or anything, then we could stretch as well. Uh, findings are often nonspecific. And so there's no classic finding with endoscopy that we see and we're like, that's amyloid. Um, typically, if we see anything that looks a bit different and if things look normal, we're typically taking biopsies looking to see if there's anything with staining. Uh, typically, um, we, we will, at least in my practice, do both an upper endoscopy and colonoscopy and take biopsies throughout. The yield is highest within the small bowel. Um, but often in practice, uh, people will choose to just look at the rectum. And the reason for that is that that's very simple to get to. You can look in that area without necessarily doing a preparation and yield is pretty good. And so that becomes a lot less invasive than going and doing an upper endoscopy and colonoscopy and a bowel, bowel prep. Now we do have a number of other tests which we can employ. This picture is actually me um, in 2006 getting manometry when I had more hair and was younger. Um, but we can empl employ other tests looking at imaging and motility studies and breath tests to try to decipher whether there is any involvement within the muscle layers or potentially the nerve layers. And so with imaging studies, we have CTs, we have MRIs and barium studies. The point of this is really to look to see, is there any gut distension? Um, and um, if we um, look at the, the bowel thickness, does it appear to be more thick than normal? We can do studies looking at motility. That's really looking at weaker muscle contractions or problems with um, gut, gut, um, gut of movement as well as, uh, as, well as, as well as gut coordination. And we have a number of different ones there. We have scintigraphy, which is where you, you eat a meal and then follow it down through. Uh, we have this test, which, which, which I've got here, which is a manometry where we, we have a, um, a very thin catheter that has pressure sensors on that look and follow contractions. We now have a wireless motility capsule that can be swallowed, which will look at um, um, 
uh, gut strength throughout. And, and there's a test that's called a SITS test, which is where you take a, a, a small capsule that has rings in, swallow that, and then take it, and, and then at that point take x-rays afterwards. We'll sometimes do breath tests as well, which will allow us to then look at both gut bacteria amounts as well as the absorption issues. Now, if we look at treatment options, you know, the, the one, one take home point, which I'd like to say is that, you know, really we try and tailor the treatment towards symptoms. And I think in most people, if people have symptoms that are reasonably common, I think we can treat those symptoms up front and that the need to do diagnostic tests really is only if people are not responding towards, towards therapies that, that uh, uh, we, we have, which are safe. And if we look at the treatment, the treatment really varies based on what area is involved and what layer we think is involved. And so if we look at the esophagus, the two main things that we, we see with that are reflux and swallowing issues. And so with reflux, the first step is often diet, diet, diet change, change and lifestyle change. And what we typically recommend is uh, weight loss if that's a factor. Uh, trying to do small, uh, low-fat meals with the idea that that'll cause less stomach distension and push um, less back up. Uh, trying to avoid meals uh, within three hours of lying down. Um, and trying to raise the head of the bed a um, couple inches. And you'll see a long list of foods which are associated with this as well. And oftentimes there's a, a, a list which will have chocolate and peppermint and onions and things along those lines, tomatoes. Um, but the bottom line is that there's no good evidence that cutting those out by itself makes a difference unless people have symptoms with those foods. And every person has a, a, a bit of a different trigger. So I typically don't recommend to cut everything out from that list to, to try and make GERD better because Oftentimes it won't make a difference and it's very limiting. And so I think from a dietary standpoint, small, low, low, low fat meals, keeping weight in a goal that's good, trying to space out dinner before sleeping, trying to raise the head to the bed a few inches. And then if you have a set, set trigger food, cutting that, that out. Now, once we get beyond that point, then we're typically looking at medications which will affect acid. And so we have antacids, we have histamine receptor blockers, and then we have meds which are referred to as proton pump and hib bit, bit bitters. And these are really the mainstay of therapy that we, we have. They're increased um, as, as you go down in terms of benefit. And so the antacids work very, very quickly. They're quite safe, they're cheap, um, but they're not tremendously effective. And so that's really good if you have heartburn every now and then and want something to, to take. Um, histamine receptor blockers, which are things such as Pepsid and Zantac, are um, um, somewhat more effective. They, they work for about four to six hours. Um, they do have what's called tachyphylaxis, which means if you take them long term, they do have some resistance with them. So typically they're best if you take it a few times a week, but not every day. And then the proton pump inhibitors, which are things such as Nexium, Protonix, things along those lines, are at this point the mainstay of therapy. They're much more effective. Um, they don't have any resistance associated with them. They are once a day, um, but they are also much more expensive and there is a, a little more concern about long-term use with them than the others that I've talked about, though we still think of them as being pretty safe. Now, once you get beyond that point, um, then we have other options in terms of different medications, supplements, um, in very select um, as well, we could look at doing endoscopy to, to try and make that um, area more tight uh, versus doing an operation. But we always want to very carefully select those patients because not everyone benefits from that intervention. In terms of swallowing, first step again is dietary modification, typically foods that pass easier, um, more soft foods, liquid, oils. Um, but if there is narrowing, we could think of doing a dilation with a balloon versus doing a Botox injection if there's uh, signs of potential spas, spasm in that area. In the stomach, we have a number of different options, but again, the, the goal is really, first off, dietary modifications, small, low-fat meals. 
Um, second, we have a category of medications that will speed gastric emptying. And so for slower stomach emptying, we have meds that can make that faster, that can help. The only one that's FDA approved for that per se right now is Reglan, which has a number of adverse effects associated with it. But we have a number of different meds as well that we'll commonly use, which are approved for uh, different indications besides the stomach, um, but do work, work in that area and have potentially a better safety pro profile. There are some herbs and, and meds that have been shown to help help the um, gut expand more and so we'll often employ that here. Well, sometimes as strange as this sounds, use medications that are really de designed to make the nerves less sensitive to essentially kind of numb up the gut so that the gut may not move faster, it may not expand more, but there may be less less symptoms associated with that. And that also appears to help. We may treat symptoms specifically. And so if the dominant sim symptom here is nausea, then we may just treat that with something such as Zofran that can, can work well. And if there's signs of gut spasm, then we could look at um, doing injections in that area. In the small bowel, the main goal is to decrease gut bacteria and to, and to try and improve the absorption. We have two ways to improve the absorption. One is to take away the, 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 the um, gut bacteria that could absorb food before it gets towards, towards the gut. The second is to speed up the gut, gut function, which paradoxically can make diarrhea better. So again, we'll um, often look at dietary modification first. And what we look for here are foods that are low in sugars. Um, we'll then look at prokinetics again to try and speed up motility. Uh, we do often do courses of antibiotics to try and take away the, the um, gut bacteria in that area. There's a med that's referred to as octreotide that can help to increase contractions within the gut, and we sometimes will use that as well. Some literature for steroids, but, but, but you know, I'd say, I'd say less in on this case. We'll occasionally use meds which will bind bile, though again, I think that's, that's a less often. And then if diarrhea is the main issue, we'll often just do meds to try and slow down the gut in that area and see if that'll make a difference. Imodium, Lamodal. And then for really refractory diarrhea that we can't control with anything else, there is literature with tincture of opium as well. And we use that also in rare cases. And then for those that have issues with um, any um, signs of malnutrition that's so severe that they can't keep caloric needs up, we'll sometimes look at doing I the uh, back to um, get that, but that's in rare, uh, rare cases. In the colon, um, again, dietary modifications first, and in this situation, we'll often try and increase roughage and see if that that helps. Um, and then, then we we have a number of laxatives which are available. In terms of the over-the-counter ones, Miralax, Senna are typically the first two which we do, and then we have four prescription drugs at present. Um, I'd say of these, Linzess and Percalipride are the two that we've had uh, that um, we've had so far. That most success with. Now, if we step back and take a look at how often biopsies are positive, um, to me at least, this has been reported to be surprisingly low. And so in 2013, there was a, um, a uh, paper that looked back at 2,334 patients with amyloid, most of whom were AL, um, and found that only 3% of them had amyloid with biopsies from the gastrointestinal tract. Now, this was retrospective. They only did biopsies in some patients that they had a high suspicion for. So it's probably an underrepresentation of still there of what's there, but still to me at least surprisingly low. 2015 from Korea, they um, did biopsies in um, those patients who they felt had um, gastrointestinal symptoms, which were out of proportion with what they'd expect, and found um, amyloid with biopsy in 15 per percent. At Stanford, um, we had looked back at our series in 2017, and again, this was retrospective and only doing endoscopy in people with symptoms that prompted suspicion, but we found 16% that had gastrointestinal symptoms reported, and of, of those, about 45% four, of that group had um, actual confirmation with biopsy. Now, uh, most recently, uh, there, there was just a paper that came out from the UK where when they looked at uh, um, their series of patients who had diagnosed 
um, um, which was mostly AAL, um, and, and they had a diagnosis with either fat pad aspirate um, or a bone marrow biopsy. They did find GI biopsies as well in about three quarters of those patients. And so to conclude, um, we, we do think that amyloid can cause symptoms by I, either um, direct tissue deposition versus involvement with, with the nerves. When we're doing endoscopy, we're only uh, getting biopsies from the mucosa uh, plus vascular. And so what that means is that if we find amyloid with biopsies, it's very specific, uh, but it's relatively in, uh, insensitive, meaning that if we don't see it with biopsies, that doesn't mean it's not there. It just might be deeper than what we can get to. We have diagnostic options as well as good therapies uh, that can be customized towards each person's symptoms specifically. And there's limited data with regards to the long-term uh, gastrointestinal effects with continued suppression of light chains. But at least what's been reported suggests that there may be a potential improvement with time with long-term long control of, um, of uh, light chain production. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you very much. Super, thank you so much. Appreciate this, Dr. Clark. And I know that you have to do scout duty, so we'll do your Q&A now, okay? You're not in uniform. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, um, first question. I have lower abdominal pain just below my belly button. I've spoken to my PC, oncologist, and amyloid specialist at Vanderbilt. My PC thought it might be a hernia, but it didn't show up on a CT. I have AL AMI with heart involvement. I am 50 days post SCT, the stem cell transplant, and this pain existed prior to my stem cell transplant. I've had a colonoscopy with biopsies that didn't show active amyloidosis. Should I insist on further tests for GI involvement? Um, it's a great, great question. You know, I think if, if this pain proceeded, um, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable to do additional testing, I think, based upon severity of symptoms. The one, you know, the, the two things that I think I'd take a look at would be gut motility um, and, and whether there's any signs um, of potential small, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth in that area. Um, the, the group in uh, Nashville and GI is, is um, actually a fantastic group. And so they're, they're uh, probably one of the best motility centers in the country. And I, I, I do think that seeing someone within the GI group there would, would be pretty reasonable with the focus question of lower gut motility um, and uh, whether this is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Okay. I wonder if the GI doctor, that's you, could tell me what might help my constantly noisy, gurgly stomach. <laughs> it feels like there is something crawling around in there, especially at night. I do not have a definitive GI AMI diagnosis as my upper and lower GI series was negative, but I certainly have symptoms. It's not painful, just very annoying and concerning. I've tried Gas-X, peppermint tea, watching what I eat and how much. Nothing seems to help. I've addressed this with my hematologist and the doctor who did my GI. They didn't have any answers and don't seem overly concerned. So, uh, you know, tough question. And, and, and you've tried a lot of the things that, that, that we'd often think of doing as um, um, first line steps there. You know, for, for um, for those symptoms, you know, the sounds themselves are very non, very non-specific, and we often can can see that in, you know, in a, a whole host of uh, different issues. So not necessarily from amyloid. Um, you know, some of the tricks that we'll often do in that scenario is to to try and do a diet which will minimize gas production. And so there's uh, um, there's one diet that's in vogue now, it's called a low FODMAP diet, which is, it's, 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 um, um, it's F-O-D-M-A-P. And if you do a lit search looking at that, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's tons of websites which, which will pop up. But what that diet is, is it's a diet that's low in any malabsorbed food particles. And so the thought is that you um, would take that, that diet for about a month see if you feel better and then slowly at that point re-add the foods back in. So I think 
you know, that's, that's one thing that I, I would think of trying. There, there is a, um, a, a different peppermint form that's out that's referred to as IB Guard. It's I-B-G-A-R-D, and it's available in most drugstores. It's um, the, the one challenge with the peppermint tea and, and, and um, those forms of it is that the peppermint gets absorbed pretty high up, and so you may not get a lot of um, benefits from that, that um, at um, point uh, points lower in the gut. And this form of it is, is uh, pH controlled, so it doesn't get um, actually dissolved until the, uh, the, um, uh, the small bowel itself. And so since we think most of the times the noise is from the small bowel and, and not stomach and large bowel, um, that may be a way to get um, peppermint directly to that area. Um, the third thing that I just mentioned is that um, there is some literature with probiotics specifically with bloating and gas production, and that might be worth trying as well. Not, not great literature, but safety is really good. Um, if you were to try anything in that category, um, the one with the best literature is probably a line, which is A-L-I-G-N. Okay, great. You've answered the next two in your presentation, so we can move, the, move along. My husband deals with ascites, and we can't seem to get it under control having to drain fluid every two weeks up to six liters. He has multiple myeloma as well, very low numbers and amyloidosis AL. Currently on one bumetanide and two spiralactone a day, taking DARA, vitamin C, IV, MAG, and steroid. Any ideas how to control this or what's going on? Yeah, that's a great question, a really tough situation. You know, when, when we look at people who have ascites, which is refractory, the challenge with ascites is that you actually can get it from a number of different sources. And so we can see it from, from a um, gut stand, standpoint if there's a decreased synthetic function within the liver, which just makes fluid kind of seep out in that area. But um, with amyloid, we often see it from uh, cardiac specifically, where if the right right heart pressures are higher, that'll cause food, food, food at that point to back up. And we can see it from nutritional issues as well. And so it's often really hard to tell with amyloid, um, is that fluid, is it cardiac related, is it liver related, is it a nutrition related? Um, in my experience, most of the times that we've seen that we, we, we've seen this situation, um, cardiac has been the big factor that's been there. So I, I, I think I, I would probably work closer with the cardiologist in, in, in terms of getting those meds, um, you know, potentially more optimized. If it is felt to be from the liver per se that's doing it and not the heart, there is this, this one procedure which we occasionally do that's called a TIPS, which is where you actually place a stent across the liver to try and decompress the pressure in that area. So if, um, if this is because of, of the liver, that might be worth doing, but if it's because of the heart, then doing a TIPS wouldn't necessarily help in that scenario. Does decreased GI motility increase formation of polyps? Is there a specific test to check GI motility? I had a colonoscopy and endoscopic procedure for biopsy purchases, uh, purposes a year ago. I've also had three colonoscopies prior to being diagnosed with amyloidosis due to polyps. I do have amyloid in my GI tract in addition to other organs. How often do I need additional GI testing and what type of testing is recommended? Do you remember the first part of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, 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 first question is we, we don't think that there's a higher rate of polyps with amyloid, but if you're on immunosuppression for any reason, that does increase the risk of polyps. So based on you know, the, the different therapies, which you may have, have may uh, be on or have been, been on, that could increase the risk potentially. Um, for those people who take immunosuppression, we'll often look every five years instead of 10. So it does slightly increase their, their, their risk, but not, not much. But just amyloid itself does, does not. Um, for those people that have polyps, we, we tend to look more often, and that interval is based on the, the type of polyp, the size of polyp, number which you've had, family history. So it's different from each person, but most people it's every five years, unless there's been a large polyp or also really you know, profound um, 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 past there. Um, in terms of motility testing, 
You know, it's um, the, the way that I think of motility testing is that it can help us tailor therapy if you're not doing well with what you're, you're on now. But um, it's not, un, you know, it, it, won't it, it won't look at polyps necessarily. It won't uh, lessen the risk of that. And I think it's very reasonable to start, um, to start the treatment up front based on symptoms and then test if that's not, not, not working. And in terms of motility testing per se, what we do would, would based on whether it's more um, constipation, diarrhea, et cetera. Um, one, one that we, we do like um, now is um, called Smart Pill or Wireless mo, mo, uh, Motility Capsule, where you take a capsule and swallow it, and it basically records pressure throughout the gut. So that's kind of a, a, a nice way of looking at everything up front. Um, but I think the reason to test would only be if you're not responding towards um, towards uh, meds, meds first. Okay, uh, Tom wants to know, how much of the direction of symptomatic treatment for GI tract involvement is determined by knowing which part of the small intestine, mucosal, submucosal, mesenteric, or any other combination thereof has been affected by amyloid fibrils? In other words, would it be useful to get an esophageal, oh wow, this is a gastro dude, yeah, some kind of scope, with or without biopsy, to determine the best treatment. Um, you know, I think I I think in most cases we we can probably make treatments based on symptoms up front, and then save testing for if if that isn't working. Um, we often will do endoscopy and colonoscopy and look to see if there is involvement. Um, often at at the uh, the request of uh, the patient or else the amyloid team wanting to know deposition, but I think you certainly can make treatment based on symptoms. Um, and, and now, but, but, but where I do find it helpful is that if we know there, there is involvement within the esophagus, for instance, we might be more likely to, you know, stretch in that area than we otherwise would if there's swallowing issues. Um, and, and if there is any sign of any involvement, maybe it makes us a little more aggressive upfront at, uh, um, at a doing things such as antibiotics, for instance. Okay, now we've got a lot of GI questions. We've got some that have been typed in and I've got more to read. I'm gonna do one more because we're really short of time, but I'm going to, I wanna get a public promise from you with something like oh, 350 witnesses, okay? That if I email you these questions, you will send me back answers that we can send to the Oh, people. definitely, definitely, definitely. And I'll, 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 um, I'll um, uh, stay here after I'm done also and type everything in too. Oh, bless your heart. We have the best doctors, don't we? Okay, so we'll read one more, uh, maybe two. Since diagnosis of AL in 2017, I've had an enlarged liver due to amyloid and have suffered multiple painful subcapsular hematomas. Hmm. Is there anything I can do to help prevent those from occurring? It's tough. You know, I, I don't know of any good options with, with that. Um, you know, we, we um, in, in terms of liver enlargement, um, you know, we, we do think suppression of amyloid production itself will, will help in, in terms of that. And there is at least limited in, info that suggests that there might be uh, long-term improvement with uh, prolonged suppression. Um, in, in terms of the, you know, the, the bleeds themselves, you know, I don't know of any therapy specifically with that. Okay, we'll do one more. Okay. Uh, could sporadic and random small GI bleeding episodes, specifically rectal bleeding, bright red blood, in absence of any other GI symptoms, possibly be the result of the disease process itself and or from the ther therapy? There's no active bleeding, just few episodes with no bleeding in between about one month of a or a few weeks apart and not large quantity. Does that does not occur with bowel movement or straining always occurs during toward end of showering or with passing gas. Hmm. So my, my gut feeling is it's probably not, not related to amyloid. Now it theoretically could, and it's, it's certainly worthwhile to have someone take a look with, with a colonoscopy and just make sure. But my hunch would be probably hemorrhoids or else a fissure would be most 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 frequent in those areas. Now, um, there is literature that if you think based on um, based on um, 
based on symptoms that it's likely to be one of those two and you do a colonoscopy, that you will find another source in about eight to 25% of people. So I do think if you haven't had a prior prior colonoscopy to look at that, it's worthwhile doing. But my gut feeling is it's probably not related and it's prob probably what, what we'd call a fissure, which is like a paper cut that's there um, uh, versus possibly a hemorrhoid, which is internal. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. As, as usual, you. you were a big hit, and we will send you questions, and you will send us answers, which we will Sounds send you. Thanks good. again. Sounds good. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the invitation. Thanks. Happy scouting. Oh, thank you.